Thanks for being here. We're uh, going to have a discussion about extracting with purpose, uh, creating shared value in the oil, gas, and mining sectors, companies, and communities. This is a uh, Chevron Forum event. Our friends at uh, Chevron, thanks, Joanna, for being here, and uh, thank you for all coming today. I think the concept of creating shared value has captured the imaginations of companies and other stakeholders. I think the room speaks for itself. I think it uh, builds on a long tradition. It's certainly beyond corporate social responsibility. I think you'll hear um, definition of, of uh, creating shared value from Dane, uh, Dane Smith in a minute. But, and you have everybody's bios in front of you, but uh, this is a group of folks who participated in putting this important report together. And I think it's important for us here in Washington to think about this uh, in a couple of different contexts. One is that this is about, this is the, the company is the protagonist. This is about companies and how companies see their role in society and what they bring to the table, not just their philanthropy or their social investment, but their standards, their procurement, uh, their investment decisions. And so as, uh, and I think as the report talks about that oftentimes there are other partners and sort of a, they're in an ecosystem of other partners. Oftentimes it's through multi-sector partnerships, uh, but also in terms of uh, working especially with governments, whether it's local governments or state governments, but also with donor governments as well. So for us here in Washington, we think about international development. The creating shared value lens is going to drive additional kinds of partnerships in the future. Uh, and so I think this is a very timely discussion. So we'll hear from different uh, panelists. Um, I think you all know me well, and so I'm, I run a pretty tight ship in terms of speakers, and so I'm gonna be running a timer to make sure that folks keep to their time that we've agreed to, because I wanna make sure that we have many knowledgeable people in this room, and so they've all agreed to abide by those ground rules as well. So uh, very uh, pleased to see so many folks. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Dane Smith, and we're just gonna go just right down the uh, row here. A little bit tight there. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Dane Smith. I'm a managing director with FSG, which is a mission driven Either consulting one. firm uh, that. Am I not on? Usually I'm loud enough so I don't need a microphone, so I hope you could hear what I had to say earlier. And now I need to lower my voice a little bit so I don't scare you from the room. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the oil and gas and mining industries represent roughly 5% of the world GDP. We're talking about approximately $3.5 trillion dollars in annual gross revenues. And if you look just at the mining industry, it employs about 3.7 million people across the globe. So something that's, it's, we're talking about in entities that are, are truly enormous here. And as you all know, many of their operations are present in very poor locations, locations that are struggling with economic development. For many of these communities and countries, the oil, and, and gas and mining industries represent one of their greatest opportunities to achieve economic growth and economic development. Um, when these communities do not feel that they are capturing some of the benefits that are associated with the, the extractives industries, 
we see that they react rather poorly. Um, and there's some data behind this. The, the ICMM has indicated that over the last 10 years, conflicts in the mining industry are on the rise. They've risen by a factor of 10 over the last decade or so. If you look at the increase in arbitration cases between the oil and gas industry and local governments, those too have, have increased by a factor of 10 over the last decade. A lot of cost is involved, and certainly um, we can all think of examples where the, com the competitiveness and the viability of, of, of very prominent companies has been in some ways compromised or damaged by local conflict. Recognizing the challenge here, companies spend a lot of money trying to capture the elusive social license to operate. A lot of spending there. Um, and um, they do this in a way that, uh, unfortunately, despite all the resources they're spending, they're not entirely successful. So in a, a report, a study done by the IFC, actually, in, um, um, I guess it's 60 companies across five countries, this was a multi-year study, they discovered that there was actually no correlation between the amount of money the companies were spending in their communities and the relationship with the communities. So something's going wrong. Lots of money's being spent, but it's not having an impact. And CEOs are very conscious of, of this as well. Uh, Andrew Harding, who um, is not the CEO, but heads for Rio Tinto, their iron ore business, in an interview for this study on, on extracting with purpose said, yes, we spend a lot of money, as do all mining companies, on short-term mitigation strategies, short-term risk mitigation strategies, but the bad news, the unfortunate news, is that spending on short-term mitigation strategies doesn't work. It does not diminish the risk that we're facing. Something is going wrong. So with that in mind, a number of our partners, FSG's partners, including Chevron represented here, but also Shell, also Rio Tinto, also Newmont, um, and then along with other partners such as IFC, Harvard Kennedy School, um, they asked us to take a, a look at what's going on in shared value um, in extractives. What, what's happening and what's the potential there? Um, and in this research, we, we um, interviewed over 170 people um, working with these companies, working in these sites. We visited a number of different, different locations. We reviewed over 200 documents issued by companies to see what's going on. And we discovered a few important things that, uh, that are happening. Um, first of all is that, yes, it's true that some companies are, are moving more toward a shared value opportunity. And I think at this point it's worth me mentioning a little bit about what the difference is between shared value and corporate social responsibility or corporate philanthropy. And I want to be careful as I'm talking about this. I'm not suggesting that CSR is not a good thing. I'm not suggesting that companies should stop spending money on corporate philanthropy because there are certainly some social issues that cannot be addressed through shared value. But when we think about shared value, this notion that companies can actually improve their business by helping to solve social problems, there are a couple of elements that traditional CSR does not have. The first of these is that there are more company resources, more financial resources available when in, in shared value, it, especially at a time right now, like right now, where the prices of commodities are decreasing, where companies are resource strapped, if companies can find ways that they can improve their business, whether that means increasing their revenues or decreasing their costs or decreasing their risk in a, in a, in a meaningful and measurable way, then they are more likely to spend money on that in a sustained manner than they will their, their CSR efforts. Um, the second thing that is different, and this is very important, is that when companies find opportunities to do shared value, that means to uh, create change in a way that is actually in the interest, the business interests of the company, there's potential to have, to craft a new kind of relationship with the communities where there's an actual alignment between what the company wants and what the community wants. And this is a very sharp contrast from the 
you win, I lose mentality that emerges many times when communities feel that they need to barter or bargain with companies for spending on community activities and community development. So this opportunity for alignment is very important here. I'm going to give you a few examples of what's happening in, in shared value, and, and Matt Lawner from Chevron is going to talk about some of the great things that they're doing in, in different parts of the world as well. But I want to talk about, mention three different ways where we find that um, extractives companies are able to, um, to, to create shared value. One is in reconceiving products um, or markets. And uh, a, 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 an, op, an idea, an example of this is when companies repurpose what they're doing around the use of water, um, the use of energy in their operations to actually find new products that they can sell. And Anglo-American is doing this in, a, in an intriguing manner in South Africa. So in a community that has significant water shortages, 30 to 40 megaliters uh, per day, um, and uh, so problems with lack of available drinking water and at a, at a place where the operating costs for a company are, are extremely high in terms of water treatment, Anglo-American has been able to build a water reclamation facility, this is in South Africa, where they're meeting 20% of the community's daily water requirements, but they're doing this, and because they are selling the, the, this resource, they're doing so in a way that their reclamation costs are offset um, by um, a total of, of 60%. So very meaningful business value to the company, and it's working so well that they've actually been able to sell these services to BHP Billiton, another mining company that needs this. So here, Anglo-American is finding an innovative way to take on and tackle the problem of water in, in and around their operations, but to do so in a way that makes business sense for them as well. A second area of opportunity is in redefining productivity in the value chain, that is, the, the operations that a, a company has, whether it's its um, manufacturing area or in its logistics or in its supply. Um, and, and you can see an interesting example of BP doing this in Baku, Azerbaijan, where it opened up an enterprise center for SMEs. Over a thousand local firms participated in the program. It increased jobs and skills and investments, and companies have wor won contracts worth $335 million. So significant local economic impact, but it's not through philanthropy. It's not the company giving it away. They're doing this in a way that actually reduces their supply costs and improves the relationships with local business and de develops specialized um, opportunities. Minutes. Why don't we just stop okay. there? Maybe we can come back for the Q&A. You can come back and Great. tell us another let me Let me just close with one thing, Dan. Okay. Um, so, the big question that you all should be wondering is if the opportunities are out there, if there's so many opportunities out there, and if you see examples of mining companies and oil and gas companies that are finding ways to either save hundreds of millions of dollars and simultaneously create measurable social change, why are more companies not doing this? Why are there not more examples? We, we scoured the world, and we were able to find some examples that you can see in our, in our study, and I've got a few copies here, but there aren't more, and there are four reasons for this. We, and we, later we, you can... We, we will be able to talk about the yeah. four reasons in the discussion. That's so, great. So the... the, the so, Dane, the, Dane, Dane, I think just, that's... Just four. The organizational yeah. structure and okay. behavior, the inability to measure this because it's a complex issue, the third is that there is low motivation to collaborate with other companies, which allows these things to happen when they're so elusive. And the fourth is the challenge of getting alignment with government, which has its, its own interests. Thank Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Okay, Matt, the floor is yours. Is, is it okay if I sit? You, it's very right. okay if you sit. I, it's, it's not because I'm lazy. I want Jane's wisdom to rub off on me. <laughs> right. It might help a little bit. Uh, so, uh, first of all, Dan, thank you for inviting us to participate, um, and, and to the rest of you, uh, actually, you're, you're welcome for the uh, spring weather that we brought with us from California. I was going to say thank you, thank you. You, you, can, you don't have to say thank you, I just, I know, I can feel it already. Um, so normally when we come and we speak at, uh, at forums like this, we're talking about accomplishments and results and things that we've, we've done over the past several years. but. 
actually, this is going to be a little bit different for us. I, I'd like to maybe share with you our sort of journey of discovery. It sounds a little bit soft and mushy for an oil company, but uh, that's sort of where we're at, and, and I think it might be interesting. Um, so to, to level set a little bit, uh, we're a California-based oil and gas business. Uh, I've been around for 135 years, and uh, we have 60,000-plus employees around the world, not counting a couple hundred thousand contractors. And you know, we have a fairly interesting business. It's complex. It's technical, technologically complex. Um, it's technologically advanced. And it comes with a fair amount of uh, geological risk. And along with that comes what we call sort of the above ground risk as well, some social and environmental risk. Uh, we operate uh, alongside neighbors that are often disaffected communities with high level of need, extreme poverty, expectations, and the word expectation is the word you'll probably hear a lot this morning, expectations around jobs, around contracts for, uh, to provide goods and services, local content expectations, communities that, where there are tensions, not only tensions between the communities and our industry, but tensions among the communities themselves. We operate in post-conflict areas, areas that have a lack of opportunity, particularly for youth, with challenging conditions around health care and education. So that's sort of the backdrop of the environment that we work in. And, and uh, the, the, the good news is I feel very fortunate because I work in a company of values, and a val set of values that guides our business activities, that ensures that we conduct our business in a socially and environmentally responsible way. Our corporate responsibility activities demand that we operate safely, that we protect workers and our neighbors, and that we engage communities. In fact, our own requirements create expectations that we engage our communities in a two-way dialogue. It's baked into our very management system. Our approach to CSR also involves a long-standing commitment to communities, and our social investment program reflects that. We invest approximately $250 million a year, making us one of the largest corporate programs in the world in the areas of health, education, economic development. These are, of course, the building blocks for strong societies. We don't do it just for altruistic reasons. We do it because we recognize that we thrive best in thriving economies. And so that's sort of the backdrop of who we are. Um, we've invested in HIV and AIDS programs in Africa, in science, technology, engineering, and math programs here in the United States. And we have these large-scale economic development initiatives all over the world that also come with their own degree of te uh, technical complexity in places like Bangladesh and the Niger Delta and here in western Pennsylvania. And throughout everything we do, the, 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 our, our investments in societies, all of our programs, this nagging question continues to perc percolate of what more can we do? What more can we do to support our business? What more can we do to support this, the communities where we operate? One of the things that we recognize is despite the scale of our social investments, and this, it, it's, it's still a drop in the bucket. There's no way that Chevron can solve all of society's problems, nor, frankly, do we view it as our role, even if we wanted to. But the question is, how do we continue to scale? The one thing Dane said, he talked about that, he mentioned that short-term mitigation doesn't work. And, and, and I, what I would say is, short-term risk mitigation does work, but it's hard to bring it to scale, and, it may, and it's likely not sustainable. And so in that regard, I think, I think we're aligned. So our journey then takes us to uh, the concept of shared value. And, and to be really frank about it, when the concept was first released by Professor Porter in 2011, we were a bit skeptical. We didn't see how it applied to us. Most of the examples that you hear cited today and that, that we heard about back in 2011, 2012, referred mostly to the consumer goods sector. If you repackage your product, can you lower cost? If you can unlock new markets by providing health education uh, to certain areas, can you uh, identify new customers for your pharmaceutical products? That all makes perfect sense, but how does it apply to us? The challenges that we're facing 
are, again, around our license to operate, our permission to operate, ability to operate and, and manage conflict, uh, to reduce operational disruption. How does shared value fit in that context? And, and it wasn't uh, necessarily apparent to us uh, a few years ago. And that stimulated conversations with Professor Porter and a lot of the people you see here today about how do we think about this in a different way? How do we think about shared value in the context of our industry? And, and, and that was sort of the, the, the foundation for the shared value, or for the, for the extractives white paper. And even, I think the, the, the drafting of that white paper was tricky and had, had a lot of, uh, required a lot of education uh, around the nature of our operations, the things that we can control for and the things that we can't control for. And over time, our thinking has started to shift a little bit. And when I say our thinking, I'm not saying the companies at large, because we are really in the early stage of, of, of discovery. If, if, uh, if any of our, uh, our executives are watching this now, they might find this to be quite new, <laughs> and, and that's okay, um, because the concept is new for us. But what we've learned is, number one, that there are pox, pockets of excellence in our business around the world. They don't know the term shared value, they're not intending to create shared value, but there are projects in Nigeria, in Pascagoula, Mississippi, in Colombia, that are trying to, to, to flip the concept on its ear. And what I mean by that is, we undertake social investment, obviously to do social good, but to support our business. I think that's obvious. But is there a way of flipping that paradigm on its axis? Can we, through our business strategies, create social good, and in so doing, as Dane was talking about, create a competitive advantage for Chevron. And that's the question. And, and I don't fully know the answer to that, but it's an intriguing question because the scale of our business is so immense. I, I mentioned how much we invest in, in, in our communities through our social investment program. In the last six years, we've spent over $250 billion in goods and services around the world. So the appeal of thinking about shared value is can we unlock our base business and bring to scale greater social impact? And can we find a way of using that to manage operational disruption, to redu redu reduce costs, um, and, and, and to improve the opportunities? And it, you know, obviously in, in a you know, 40, $50 a barrel environment, uh, the more efficient we can become, the better it is for our business and the better it can be for society as well. Um, I don't know how much time I, Dan, yeah, do I have time to talk about, let me, let me talk about one example that some of you may be familiar with, Niger Delta, difficult place to operate. So uh, this is an area in the 90s, was ripe with conflict, all kinds of tension, disaffected and armed youth in the Delta, they stole equipment, we had our operations attacked, there were demands for jobs, for contracts, for, for money. There's competition among communities for land, ethnic conflict. Villages near our operation were often destroyed, and we experienced illegal bunkering of oil. Shut in oil means reduction in production. It doesn't get any more close to the business than that. And our community projects weren't working. Uh, and to Dane's point, uh, they were having, they were creating benefit but they weren't working for our business and clearly weren't meeting the needs of the stakeholders. So 10 years ago, we undertook a new approach and we called the GMOUs, the General Man Memorandum of, of Understanding. We negotiated independently with the eight regional development committees that represented hundreds of communities. And with, a, a, uh, with principles that all ethnic groups would be treated equally and we were guided by the World Bank principles on development to make sure that development projects were owned and developed, implemented by the local communities themselves. I mean, by engaging communities in this way and by building the capacity of communities and these RDCs to manage conflict amongst themselves, we all of a sudden saw different results. Over 500 projects have been developed and implemented, owned, by these often rival contingencies or constituencies. More importantly, 
for our business standpoint, I don't mean more importantly for society, but more importantly for our business standpoint and for this discussion, in 1998 we had over 80, uh, uh, 80 disruptions to our operations. By 2012, we had zero. Now, I can't promise that number remains intact forever, right? There, it's a fluid situation, the Niger Delta is complicated, and that, that would be disingenuous. But clearly, you, we can see a direct linkage between what we're doing to support our business operation and building the capacity of local communities to manage conflict, which has a much huger impact on society than building a hospital or a clinic. That's one example. I'm happy to talk about more and talk about the GMO use in more detail. But, you know, I, I, I guess my final comment is, again, we are at a journey. Most of the, thing, most of the, the, the comments I have are really questions for ourselves. Um, we're at the early stages. We're trying to identify best practices that exist in our company, see if we can model it, see if we can develop a proof of concept. And if we can, is it something that we can bring to scale? Um, and so I'd say we're at the, the early phases of this, uh, of this journey. Uh, and, and happy to, to talk about uh, kind of where we're heading next. Thank you very much. Jane, thanks for coming down from Boston to be with us. Thank you. You'll be pleased to see that I didn't bring any snow with me from, from Boston. <laughs> thank you for that. Getting rid as, of as well, thank you, well. thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. But uh, great, great to be here. Um, I think when we, when we talk about the role of oil, gas, and mining, to me, they're, they're, they're two fundamental leadership imperatives, whether it, you know, we're looking at shale gas development in Pennsylvania and mining here in Nevada, United States, or we're looking at Papua New Guinea and Nigeria. And I think the two leadership imperatives are, are first, and, and not necessarily foremost, but absolutely critical, the ongoing day in, day out, identification, prevention, mitigation of risk. And, and it is important, and yes, the short-term risk management isn't enough, but it's continues to be challenging and critical every single day. And there's also the systemic risk management around governance, around benefit sharing, which leads into shared value. But, you know, so I think that that risk management piece is incredibly important and is linked to shared value. But then the second imperative is identifying and creating shared value. And that can be you know, shared value at the level of the project with local content, so local employment, local training, local enterprise development. It can be shared value in the broader community with you know, really effective community development foundations, with consultation with communities. And it can be and needs to be shared value in terms of how the actual resource taxes and royalties are paid and used by governments. But those two fundamental imperatives of you know, identifying preventing and mitigating shared risk and identifying and creating shared value, I think are the same you know, regardless of the size of project or, or, or where they happen. And, and you're know, focusing more on the shared value piece, but also on the risk piece. Why, why isn't it happening more? And I want to just pick up a, a, um, on the, the, the uh, introduction that Dane made to some of the challenges. I, I think there's three um, sort of real leadership challenges that, that pretty much all, all companies are, are facing. And the first set is internal challenges to getting this right. And that I think in the majority of oil, gas, and mining companies, even the leaders, there's still too much of a silo between the project management operational teams on the one hand and environmental, social, community relations teams on the other. You know, there's still different metrics, there are different incentives, there are different skill sets, there are different mindsets. And there are often different time frames, and that anyone, and I know I'm looking out at this room, a number of you who've done community-based consensus building and consultation takes years. And yet, you know, if you're doing a construction project, you've got to be very focused on getting it in on schedule, on time, you know, safely and, and hopefully with minimal risk. So even sort of reconciling time frames often between the project management teams and the community relations teams internally can be challenging. There's the, you know, the link of, 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 of not just different metrics, but not necessarily respecting each other's metrics. And so we need to get a lot better at managing and, 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 and sort of, and, and identifying the return on, on social investment to the business, which is obviously part of making the business case, but also at measuring the development impact of social programs for consult consultation with communities, etc. I think we need to ensure that the engineers and the project managers and the finance guys and girls better understand 
the social dimensions and, and, and the fact that there is a, a technical skill set that is every bit as important now as an engineering technical skill set. And so, you know, for example, Rio Tinto has started a program um, for all of their senior managers, you know, regardless of what their functions are, to better understand the social, environmental, governance, risk aspects of the business. So, so you know, making sure that even if you have continue to have, and you need to have different skill sets, because you need anthropologists and, and uh, you know, development experts often in the community relations area. You need the engineers clearly in the, the operations and the, and the project management area. But you know, how do we ensure that there's greater knowledge and understanding and mutual respect internally for each other's skill sets and, and, and capabilities. So you're seeing also more companies setting up cross-functional teams, um, you know, at, at the, at, whether it's at the mine site or the project site or at the corporate level. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing these you know, training programs, you're seeing communities of practice beginning to emerge, and a much, much stronger focus, and I'll, Veronica might want to pick up on this, on the metrics piece, and really trying to find ways to understand and respect um, each other's metrics and get better, particularly at the social metrics. I think we're pretty good at the environmental and the, the safety metrics now, but the social metrics is where there's a lot of work needed. So that's a sort of like the first set of challenges. How do we get um, the sort of organizational structures and the culture um, and the metrics working internally um, you know, to really get better at the shared risk management and, and, and creating shared value? I think the second set of challenges is around this area of building, effectively building consensus and partnership, um, whether it's at the community level or more broadly. Um, and it, it's not easy, and, and I, you know, many of you in this room have the, have the practice of trying to do it, that you're just building consensus with local communities, identifying who's important in local communities, going beyond the traditional leaders, and you know, making sure particularly gender is brought into it, that women have a voice, that young people have a voice, that the non-traditional leaders are, are part of the, the, the discussion and the effort around building consensus. You're building partnerships with non-governmental organizations, whether it's an international group like Mercy Corps or in Peru, a local NGO like Cooperacion, you know, how do we build, you know, again, greater mutual respect and trust between massive big projects and companies and, and often sort of smaller NGOs and recognize that both have um, you know, different competencies and capabilities to, to, to bring to the table. So I think a lot of work still needs, I, I, I sort of worry we've got um, very glib in the, you know, terminology of public-private partnerships, and we need partnerships, and we do, but that, that recognition... I used to pay my they, mortgage on those. Yeah, right? so, so. But the, the, yeah, the recognition that they, they, they're difficult and challenging to build, and, and again, we need to really focus on building the skill sets to, you know, to, to achieve more effective both con consultation and consensus building as well as partnership. And then third and very quickly, I, I think the, the, the biggest challenge um, that we have to acknowledge face on is government and governance. Um, and uh, you, companies, the oil and gas and mining companies can control what they can control at the project level, at the local level, and, and that's hard enough. But we you know, can never ignore the fact that the billions of dollars are what are being paid in royalties and taxes and revenues to government. And, and finding ways more creative, and I think the donor community has a very important role to play here in building government capacity. There's a, the there's a challenge of bad governance and, and corruption and you know, working collectively. I think the industry can work collectively as we are seeing with the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, where industry is coming together collectively to address some of the, um, the sort of corru corruption, human rights challenges in governance. And I think now there's an opportunity to work more collectively on the, the distribution aspects of, of revenue management. So you know, we, we, we need to focus on the transparency of revenue payments and, and tackling corruption. But once the revenues have been paid, how can we be more creative at saying these billions of dollars are now in the government coffers? You know, how do we make sure that there's better allocation between national government, regional government, local government? How do we build the capacity of regional and local governments to better use those resources? You know, how does the, the business sector, particularly the extractor sector, but with other companies, get more engaged in, in setting priorities? You know, is money going to be spent on infrastructure? Is it going to be spent on agriculture? I don't know if anyone from Oxfam is here, but they've got an interesting um, program in Ghana at the moment called Oil for Agriculture, and sort of actually saying, you know, how do we take some of the extractive revenues and be very explicit and conscious and collective 
on, on how those revenues are allocated to other productive sectors um, and other employment creation sectors, because at the end of the day, oil, gas, and mining don't create a lot of direct employment, but they can have incredible multiplier employment effects if the, the, the revenues are well spent. So I think those sort of three areas of the sort of the, 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 the company level, project level, getting it right between the technical engineering teams, business teams, and the community relations teams, and the metrics right, um, and then at the, the sort of the broader community level, building the consensus and partnerships um, that are needed, and then the governance, the broader governance level, are the, you know, the great opportunities for both creating shared value and better managing risk. I can only say amen. I think I was talking earlier, and I said why I think the kinds of work that Jane does at Harvard, we actually need to be thinking about how do we incorporate that kind of curriculum at the Colorado School of Mines, actually, in some ways, in terms of the operation folks who actually who actually, when they grow up, become managing directors or country managers. They're not necessarily, you know, they're not, they may or may not be, you know, that, that actually the, it's a different community of people that it's in the engineering schools and others. So I think that's, that's one. I do think one of the interesting things in the report is there's discussion about how one of the banks added a, increased the discount rate on projects given the community risk. And so that does get operational folks' attention in terms of when it touches them at a, at a business level. And then I think this other issue of government and governance, we've done a lot of work here um, around strengthening procurement systems of developing countries, thinking about local government, especially in the context of urbanization. Uh, but also, I think there's this very large conversation now that's going to go on around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals around domestic resource mobilization. And so I think Chevron's the largest taxpayer in Peru and Bangladesh, so tax, taxes and fees um, from companies and from individuals is something like 10 times the amount of all foreign aid to give you a sense of it and certainly multiples and multiples of that of all corporate philanthropy. So having capable governments really does matter. USAID used to have in the 50s and 60s a whole practice called public administration and perhaps we need to perhaps return to that as part of a part of this discussion it certainly touches on that. So thank you Jane for those I agree with you. Graham, thanks for being here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm going to start out by saying a little bit about who Mercy Corps is and, and, and why we're here and then why we're so interested in the, the potential of, of shared value programming with extractives companies. Mercy Corps is an international non-governmental organization, an INGO. We're about 4,500 people living and working in communities in about 40 countries around the world. And <clears throat> since 1979, uh, our mission has been to help people facing some of the world's toughest problems overcome those problems and not just survive, but thrive. And in the last year alone, we've reached 17 million people uh, with our programs and helped them live better lives, recover more quickly from disasters, put more food on the table. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, live better lives. And we know that every community is different, but we also know that we see better results when we see better results when excuse me. Sorry, thanks. I'll go to Veronica. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Veronica. So you're at IFC. And tell me about uh, this conversation around metrics and measurement. And you guys were the founders of the Equator Principles. And I think that touches on this issue of touching that some of the social and environmental issues that have come up in this conversation. A lot of the standard setting and a lot of the work comes from IFC. Tell us what is IFC. It's not the Independent Film Channel, right? So tell us a little bit about that. Tell, tell us what it is and tell us how you guys planted this because I think the point that the report makes is this is about companies, and so Mercy Corps or uh, IFC in some ways are part of that ecosystem, but this is about companies, and so how do you guys fit into the conversation around companies? Okay, well, Dan asked me to tell you that I'm not part of the Independent Film Channel, but I sort of wasn't going to mention it because I thought you might pay more attention if you thought I was. So now you've kind of ruined that for me, Dan, <laughs> but I'm going to try and power through anyway. Can um, they talk to you afterwards if they want to learn more about the Independent Film Channel? Maybe. <laughs> if you can introduce me to somebody, please. Right, right. Uh, so IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. 
We are the world's largest development actor focused exclusively on the private sector. Because we don't invest here in the U.S. and only invest in developing countries, a lot of folks in D.C. actually don't know us very well. Um, essentially, you know, we provide both debt and equity to different clients. I work in the extractive industries and infrastructure group. Uh, I'm on the advisory services side, so we have an investment arm of the IFC, and then we also offer advisory services all focused around shared value. So our feeling is that shared value is essentially our core product. You know, at the end of the day, that should be our widget. Um, we focus on investing for profit, but we reinvest all of our profit into emerging markets to spur further development. Just to give you a sense of you know, the, the, the opportunity of shared value that we see to put a little additional hope, I think it's been a very hopeful conversation already, but uh, you know, in the reporting period of 2014, our oil, gas, and mining clients, which our commitment um, across oil, gas, and mining last year was about uh, 2.5 billion, um, our clients contributed 4.7 billion to government revenues across countries, um, created or sustained 92,000 direct jobs, spent approximately 49 million on community investments, and uh, invested seven, or purchased 7.9 billion in local and national goods and services. And we're actually a fairly small investor, you know, compared to what's really happening out there in all the equator banks. So I just want to uh, just, mention that. Just give them a sense of the size of the inve your investment, because it's actually quite, it is impressive, though. I mean, it's something like 15 or $20 billion in investments every year. Yeah, and so, I mean, last year we committed $2.5 billion just in oil, gas, and mining. So, but, you know, just to say that our market is still relatively niche, because we have these pretty high environmental and social and governance standards, um, and yet now the equator banks are following those same principles. The, the real difference, because you brought it up, Dan, is that within IFC, if you're an investee, we have uh, a lot of environmental and social governance experts that then go out and review your project on their own um, and report back to us whether or not you've been able to uh, not just comply, but whether or not you're moving towards environmental, social, and governance standards that are going to help mitigate the risk to your business and also share value locally and make sure that there are enduring benefits from that investment. Um, and maybe just to mention that the reason a lot of this focus for IFC came about was in 2005, 2006, there was an extractive industry review across the World Bank Group, which some of you might be familiar with. And there was a big question, you know, sometimes I get asked at these events, you know, other, some people are pulling out of extractives. Why are you guys still so active? And I think our feeling is that it is critical to be part of the positive process and solution. And so maybe I can give a couple of examples of where we are investing in um, shared value. Actually, before I do, I, I just wanted to mention, um, it's always hard to speak after you know these very insightful friends and colleagues, but something that hasn't come up yet that I just want to put on the table is the downturn that we're in right now. And I think a lot of you are in this space. And it's a really difficult time. And so even talking about shared value and, and walking that talk is always difficult. But I just want to, among friends, bring a, a new kind of reality check into the room because talking about it and implementing it now is even more challenging. And so as we open up for discussion, I would really welcome uh, insights and experiences on, on what it's feeling like today. Um, let's see, so just some examples of the work that we do with our clients to uh, try and share value is we invest in local content in Guinea and Ghana. We invest in capacity building for local government to better manage extractive revenue in Peru and Colombia. We work with uh, mining companies in Mongolia on water stewardship and water management that includes not just technical, but also social and political and cultural concerns. Um, and increasingly, we're moving into the space of shared infrastructure. So whether it's Guinea or Mozambique or Brazil, you know, both transport and power, how do we use our extractive investments to be uh, a real catalyst for bringing new infrastructure into remote places? Um, as IFC, as an investor in this space, what we often get asked, maybe by some of you in the room, I won't ask you to raise your hands, is how does IFC decide whether or not a particular investment is going to lead to shared value? How do we know that an investment that you make as a development agency 
is going to share benefits that are enduring across the host society. And this is something that we are really, um, we've decided that it's really important to lift the veil on what was seen as maybe a not well understood process that IFC goes through and share kind of the art and science of how we assess benefit sharing across our extractive investments. And so we have a new paper that's just out. It's actually on comdev.org, uh, C-O-M-M for communitydevelopment.org. And I, it, it dubbed- the title of it? It's called The Art and Science of Benefit Sharing in the Natural Resource Sector. Okay. <laughs> Strongly it, recommended. Okay, we're, we're very creative. If you have trouble sleeping at night. Yes, uh, right. yes. no, actually, uh, no, I would read this one over breakfast. I think okay. this is really worth looking at. <laughs> <laughs> because what, what really, I think the reason we're here today, Dan, is because as IFC, as an investor, with a development mandate that we are held to quite rigorously by our board and our shareholders and our, you know, our clients ultimately in country, is whether or not our investments are having a positive local impact. And so I just wanted to share a couple highlights from the benefit sharing paper, and then I'll mention the financial valuation tool, if that's all right. Essentially, um, for every single project we do, we have a rigorous process, but it has to be multidisciplinary, and that's where the art and science both come in. It's not enough to just benchmark your asset or your investment or project against other projects either in that country or in other countries, because there is so, much, uh, so many differences that need to be factored in. And of course, there is a huge fiscal element to benefit sharing, and we spend a lot of energy, and I think we all have historically, on trying to assess the fiscal regime and the cost and benefit sharing. But that's too narrow a focus. When we think about the opportunity for shared value and extractive investments, we have to be looking at a broader array of both costs and benefits. So we think it's critical to incorporate the economic perspective on costs and benefits, but also factoring in environmental and social and other good things like infrastructure, like water stewardship, making sure that we account for all of that. And that is essentially the process that we go through project by project. And this paper highlights for you the questions that we ask ourselves internally when trying to figure this out. And the reason that we're making it public for the first time is because we hope that it will be used as a platform. It does a sound like something you should read over breakfast, actually. This is pretty good. <laughs> I'm going I'm yeah. to buy you coffee after yeah, this. Right so, but it, it's essentially to provide you with a table of contents for the conversation, the multi-stakeholder dialogue that you should be having in country. Right? This has to be multi-stakeholder. I think, to me, the key issue is constituencies and also time frame. I like to use, I'm moving more and more to the word constituencies. I'd love to know what my fellow panelists think, because particularly here in Washington, I know you understand what I'm talking about, right? A stakeholder may or may not have influence. A constituent has a voice that actually matters and has to be accounted for and responded to. So when I think about benefit sharing at a country level, I like to think about all, have all the different constituencies been represented and accounted for. Um, and then I think the other key issue, and I'll move on, is um, time frames. You know, that part of why we need all the constituencies at the table is that everybody, as Jane pointed out so clearly, everybody understands time frames differently, and they have very different expectations. So when we look at a project and we say to the government and to the client, yes, we have assessed the lifespan of this asset, and we believe that over time it will produce a reasonable sharing of fiscal benefits. But over time, I mean, the government might not see that revenue for many years. There's a huge long process before that happens, and for a lot of these governments, this is a new industry for them, and they don't understand those time frames. And then they don't know how to explain that to their constituents on the ground who are having an even longer time horizon where they get all the, the costs up front and the benefits much later. Uh, so I think this is, and now in this downturn, you know, how we've made commitments to meet certain time frames, and now the schedules are off. So what are we going to do to communicate and to have a new conversation revising those time frames with all of our different hosts in country? And I think this is, uh, we're probably kind of late in having this conversation. And so anyway, our hope is that this will help to get that conversation started. I would, would really welcome feedback from anybody um, who has a chance to look at it. Because of the two critical two of the critical barriers that FSG so um, 
poignantly uh, remarked on in their paper on shared value, and that Jane also reiterated about the barriers to making shared value happen. One is, you know, the intern a lack of internal alignment. I mean, this is, I would say, all of our advisory work for all of our clients is focused on trying to improve their internal alignment. I mean, this is kind of top secret, because everybody thinks we're, we're all focused on the external partnerships, but we find that the the, the sharing of value and the healthy, resilient relationships with their stakeholders often are not happening because there isn't clear internal alignment across business functions. So I really appreciate that focus. Are, are you, yes, yes, you're wrapping I'm me up. I'm using my subgroup in once. He was raising his eyebrows. It was very yeah, mysterious. Yeah. Um, and then the other issue is really, are we measuring the return that companies are getting back from making investments in shared value? And that's really why I was asked here today. So. Over the last four or five years, we've been working with Rio Tinto, Newmont, Cairn, Pacific Rubialis, and now increasingly agriculture companies, and Deloitte, and uh, MIGA, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency at the World Bank Group, to design a process and a software and a, a tool to help companies at the firm level assess the net present value return that they get back at the asset level from making investments in shared value and sustainability. I'd be happy to share more examples of that, but just to say, because as has been talked about today, sometimes the incentive, particularly in a downturn, is not clear. It looks like pure outlay, because the community relations team or somebody else is spending, but the benefit might be coming back to the land acquisition team or to HR or to procurement, and the equation across the entire organization of the different functions is not put into one place. So I'd be happy to give some examples about that. Thank you. Okay, Graham, was it something I said? Uh, no, I think it's that I didn't have breakfast. I think next time I'm gonna have breakfast before I do this. Um, <clears throat> I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll shorten it up a little bit, but um, as I said, Mercy Corps is an international non-governmental organization. And we're working in about 40 countries around the world. And we really work with company, countries and companies, communities from within. Um, we know that every community is different and that the solutions are gonna be different for every community. Uh, so we don't arrive with a preset agenda for, for success. But we have found one thing to be true almost everywhere that we work. And that's that we get the best results when, um, when business, government, and the community are all, society are all kind of working together towards the same goal. And we work in some of the world's toughest places around the world. Places like Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Iraq. And we look around those places and we ask ourselves, who else is here? Who else has a commitment to this community? a long-term commitment and a long-term stake in its success. And we ask who has the resources to do something about that. And it's often, it's often a resource, an extractives company. Um, and the potential has not always been realized. As, uh, as Dane pointed out, um, the success of those kinds of, that potential alignment has not always, has not always worked out. Um, but we think shared value offers an opportunity. It offers bold ideas, and we know we're going to need those to solve these kind of problems. It offers partnership, and we know we can't solve these kind of problems alone. And it offers a long-term perspective. And to help move the last billion, 1.3 billion people in the world out of extreme poverty, these are people that are living <clears throat> exactly in those places in the world's toughest places. To help move those people up out of extreme poverty, we're going to need those three things. Bold ideas, new partners, and a long-term long -term commitment. And it's early days for shared value. We don't know if it's going to fulfill that potential, but that's why we're excited about it. Thank you very much. Can I, uh, Jane, do you want to just, just yes. One point, building on what Graham said, I think I'm, um, you're coming back to this partnership question, the, the role that Mercy Corps, or I see Catholic Relief Services here, and Consensus Building Institute, the role that, that some of the humanitarian and development NGOs can play as intermediaries, 
I think, between the companies and the communities is, is again, one of the, the most untapped areas, I think, for, for achieving those, those objectives. And um, yeah, I, I recognizing think, that, I think, is well, important. I, you know, I think it is a company-centric discussion, but yeah. companies on their own, companies recognize, I think, uh, that they can't do it alone. And so if it's not, if, it, if it's whether it's connecting to supply chains or whether it's, uh, whether it has to do with uh, having good community relations, it's 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 on their own. They can't. They they do. Make, it's it's uh, it requires partnership. And I think that was one of the things I thought that collaboration. I guess was the term that was used in the report. Yeah, Jane. Just but, but but actually, so, um, you know, intermediation. So it's not just you know the company partnering with the Mercy Corps or a Consensus Building Institute, but you know Mercy Corps and, and Consensus Building Institute and others intermediating between the company and its other partners, I think, is a new thing we haven't looked at enough before, which I think is so exciting. All right, so I had lots of questions I could ask you all. I do think I'm going to open it up to the audience. We've got about 20 minutes, and I do think the audience deserves a chance to, to ask you all. So I'm going to ask folks to be economical in your answers, uh, but also I would ask you guys, I think, to take one of Veronica's points about, okay, one thing I do want you to do in your responses is to say, okay, briefly, What's this mean in a, in a downturn environment, at least in the oil, gas, and mining sector? With What, it, what does this mean, or how do, you, how do you do that? So that's the one question I'd, I'll, I'll ask you guys to park. Uh, so I'm going to, we've got, I'm sure there's lots of hands, so we're going to make a deal, right? So we're going to get lots of questions, but everyone's going to honor the fact that we've got a lot of people, and so we're going to keep it brief, and we're going to have name, rank, and serial number, and then we're going to have the question, right? So we've got microphones. Okay, so I want to hear from Andrew Mack. I hear from this uh, woman in the middle here, and then I want to hear from this man standing, right? So we're going to bunch them together, World Bank group style, since it's IFCs here is World Bank group style, as opposed to World Bank style, okay? Right. Th thanks, Dan. A Andrew Mack, AM Global, uh, great panel, really excellent. Uh, to, uh, the, qu the quick question is this. We now have in, in Africa, for example, 42 countries who now have, uh, they have, they have proven reserves of oil and gas. Uh, or either, either they're producing, but most of them are not. Most of them are new, new, to, new to the thing, which means that you've got a tremendous number of new actors. We had the privilege of working with Chevron for six and a half years on a road safety project, which was amazing, but Chevron has a long timeline and has some significant resources to work with. How do, new, how do, how do the entrance of new, smaller groups in the resource extraction uh, uh, sphere, how do they change the dynamic? How do they change that dynamic for larger, longer-term players and what are the lessons that we should learn from these new actors? What should we be asking them to do that's within their reach? Okay, I think, I think it's a good one, Andrew, and I think I'm thinking of a company like Hess, where they, they say they are winning contracts and awards because of their social and environmental reputation, so thank you for that. Um, this woman here, and then this gentleman standing. No, yep. Hi, uh, Holly Drank Guinness from the Enough Project. Thanks so much for all your comments. It's been an interesting conversation. Um, I was just hoping to hear a bit more from any of you uh, specifically on setting up effective and responsible security systems at operations, um, whether that's with public actors or private. Um, typically it's both, right? Um, especially in conflict-affected areas where there's almost always a tension between mitigating the real risk of armed actors and fulfilling basic human rights, avoiding arbitrary detentions, respecting the freedom of, it, of expression. You know, there's been a lot of normative progress in this area, but just really curious about your perspectives on how it's going in practice. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, this gentleman over here. Mike, there's only one microphone. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hello, Niels Handler. I'm from the public sector of the World Bank, working on local content. And I would like to ask you, uh, where do you see in all the different parts of shared value creation that you talked about, where do you see it uh, ranking in terms of priorities? Maybe, Veronica, I guess since in your shared value paper, you're looking at like, different aspects, if you can sort of uh, talk about that. Um, and especially now in the downturn also, uh, is it a topic that that increases in importance, so uh, which I think was kind of the message from the mining conference in, in Daba, and Matt, maybe you can talk about, is that the same for the oil and gas industry? Thanks. We're gonna go Veronica down this way. Veronica, you're first. Okay. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the, I'll give them different weight, because I think there's 
different, you know, a lot of expertise next to me, so I want to be fast. But um, I really like the point about new players and new companies and what are our new expectations. I think that's a huge concern, particularly for us, because so much of what we're doing is in the emerging space. And uh, it, it is what I think the biggest caution is kind of Jane alluded to is that we're just trying to move too fast. And you know the, the developers are probably trying to move too fast and the governments are trying to keep pace because they also are desperate for the revenue. But you know, it's, it's just a lot harder to clean up if we don't get those systems and capacities and skills in place ahead of time. So you know, I know we can say it and nobody will listen and everybody will still be rushing towards the gold, but um, I feel like if there was some way collectively that we could agree that we have to pace ourselves in the beginning, that would make a huge difference and people would be less frustrated. I think Larry Suskind from MIT you know, has a great phrase that you've got to go slow to go fast later. Um, so anyway, that's a quick comment on that. Um, and I'm afraid in terms of the local content and benefit sharing, I, I missed the specifics of the question in terms of... Um, Oh, that, thank you, sorry. I would say it's up at the top, um, particularly where you have national governments coming up with more and more legislation requiring some form of local content. My concern is that that often sometimes is a knee-jerk response because they've been told that that's the only way to get shared value. And sometimes I think the requirements have not been designed in consultation with uh, the business actors and others in the country, and so sometimes we set unrealistic goals that, you know, end up the parties that should be collaborating are kind of in court instead, and that's not probably a good use of energy. So I think, though, coming behind it and what may ultimately surpass it, I'm sure lots of people will disagree with me, but I think it's probably shared infrastructure. And so I think it's just a matter of time, whether it's, you know, power and transport, but also increasingly water management and stewardship I think are probably gonna crowd out that space. I hope because that'll just become so normalized um, that we'll end up struggling more on the infrastructure side. But I'd love to hear what others think. I'm gonna let others tackle the security okay. issue. So let's, let's just go, we're gonna go down the row. Do you wanna, Graham, do you wanna answer any of these? Use the microphone. Sure, yeah, I was just thinking about security, which is, uh, you know, always been an issue for NGOs like Mercy Corps and the places where we work. Um, and it's increasingly a, a big issue uh, for us. And it's complicated, and I'm not our security manager, so I, I won't go deeply into it, but just to say more maybe about how we approach it and, and what it has to do with shared value even. And that's, you know, our security as a, a nonprofit in dangerous conflict-ridden areas comes from transparency and from building a long-term um, reputation with the community and everyone in it for transparency and for being an honest broker. And that's the kind of relationship that we bring to a shared value project that we think helps the company also maintain the kind of um, secure presence they need in a community. And it, it's, what, it's what also keeps us safe in that community. I think that's a, a, a great point, and I'm building on that to me from the company perspective, they're, they're, they're the two elements of security. And one which I don't think we look at enough is the how do you use your community consensus building and consultation and engagement strategy as part of your overall security strategy. And you know, think more about how you build trust as part of the security strategy. But then there is the actual you know, training and, um, and, and uh, mobilization of security forces, both public and private. And I personally think, I know the voluntary principles for security and human rights have a lot of challenges, but I think, to me, they're one of the most exciting things that have happened in terms of getting industry-wide sort of buy-in to something. It's not industry-wide, but the, the, the major players. As always, the challenge is then the implementation on the ground. And I, you know, I think we are making progress. Um, I think, again, there's a, a great role for intermediary organizations, whether it's the Mercy Corps or the Red Cross. I know, you know like in Papua New Guinea, the Red Cross is helping to sort of intermediate between companies and um, the security forces and do training of security forces. So I think the need to you know, continue the training, being vigilant, um, and you're building the capacity of those security forces, again, is, is a form of shared value. So you're managing your security risk, you're hopefully 
carefully managing human rights risks and respecting human rights, but you're also building the capabilities of security forces you know, to be better to serve the citizens that they are supposed to be serving of their public security forces. So, so uh, yeah, it's a longer conversation, but I think there's, there's, there's progress being made, but we shouldn't just think about the, the, the traditional security aspect, the community engagement, but I think needs to be part of security strategy and the gender piece, I think, very importantly, needs to be part of security strategy. Local content, um, I think from the, the company perspective, uh, you know, there's still you know, a lot that companies can do, but I think they're doing some very interesting work there. I agree with, um, with Veronica that the opportunity for both shared infrastructure going forward, but also you know, collectively working, say like in a Tanzania or some of the new countries where, where oil, gas, and mining are becoming more important. You know, how can the industry work together on joint enterprise development centers, joint vocational training initiatives, as well as their own, so that you're actually you know, building local content you know, at a more strategic level, and um, you know, business-to-business -business partnerships, I think, have a great opportunity there. And, and Andy, your, your question, it's a, it's a mixed bag, isn't it? Because some of the, the smaller players, like the Hesses and the Andarkas of this world, I, you know, I think are real, you know, finding a niche place based on social and environmental impact. Others are sliding under the radar screen with very bad standards. And you know, there's a question of the, you know, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, and other companies coming in and how we work with them. But it's, a, you know, it's going to be very, very important to engage as much as possible and share, share good standards. Thank you. Matt, a lot of this was directed towards you and I think somewhat to Dane. So both of you, I think, would, I want to, will give, give you guys a chance to respond. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let me speak uh, first to the question about uh, local content. I mean, as Veronica said, you know, there are, certainly a lot is being driven by uh, national content regula regulatory schemes, but, but community expectations driving a lot of the local content requirements. And the, the good news is, I think, uh, I agree with Veronica, it's at the very top of the list for us in terms of how it can, can be used as a, as a force for, for shared value. But I would also say that it's got the most moving parts associated with it. It's, it's one thing to work with a Mercy Corps to train local entrepreneurs. It's quite another to try to, uh, to uplift uh, potential suppliers and building the passive local supplier to meet our standards and, and community standards. That's a much trickier nut to crack, uh, but, but something I think that, that, that there's great potential to unlock. We spent a lot of time here talking about building capacity, and I think that it comes in many forms. Mm -hmm. Certainly building the capacity of local suppliers is critical, but also working with local implementing partners uh, on local content strategies, which I think, again, are more complex. It's one of the reasons, actually, why we're working with Mercy Corps and FSG on an international NGO working group to help build the capacity of, of NGOs to think with a shared value context. And we haven't really talked much about that, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there uh, of, of training field practitioners uh, in, in the shared value construct. Um, but it's also building capacity internally. So, as Jane said, we do have these sort of sometimes disaggregated pieces. We've got the CSR functions that are distinct from the supply chain management functions, and, 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 their, and their function is focused on managing procurement, uh, not building capacity of local suppliers. And so it requires sort of this triad between implementers, supply chain management, uh, and, and the, the CSR function uh, in a way that is, is fairly uh, complex and difficult. But but again, I think it's got the most potential to scale if we can get it right. Uh, you know, the, the question of, about the kind of the smaller players, as far as I know, there hasn't been much discussion in industry associations about shared value. Um, and, and it probably is something that, that in, in the time has probably come to have those conversations. Um, and again, as I said, we're, we're sort of at the beginning of this journey. Um, and I think other oil and gas companies are, are looking at it as well. Um, and so I, I think that conversation is probably bound to happen sooner rather than later. Um, and I think that's probably your greatest opportunity to, to bring those in who maybe don't have this, the same access and, and, um, uh, and level of development in, in this space. Okay, thank you. Dane. Yeah, real quickly here, great questions, first of all. Um, on local content, first of all, yes, super high priority. And, and yes, Matt, as Matt has indicated, it's very hard. Um, What's happening, though, is companies are, are recognizing that they need to be prepared for this so they don't get taken by surprise by national legislation that is going to impose on them really high requirements of, of local content and then force them to spend a lot more money uh, in, in a non-strategic way. And so companies want to be prepared for that, and the smart ones are getting ahead on that. Now, what, what is critical is that 
companies, when they're thinking about this, need to be both persistent and, and ambitious. I can't tell you how many companies have said, oh yeah, we looked at that, and we have tried to train local companies to be local content suppliers, but we've discovered that really the only thing that we can do is we can use them to help provide food service, or we can use them to help clean up around the facilities. Um, we, we tried the training programs, and they don't work. Well, what's happened is that they've tried, many of them have tried very short training programs, and it's not often possible to train a local company in six months what's really required to be an effective deliverer of, of quality services that a company needs in order to be competitive. Um, and companies do a disservice to themselves if they then close their eyes to the challenge of that, or if they decide, well, we don't think these companies really can be competitive, so we're not going to hold them to as high standards, or we're going to pay uh, above uh, market prices for their services, because that, in turn, does not help those companies uh, become competitive over, uh, competitive over the long term. So it's important for them to be persistent and think broadly about what is the challenge of, of, of helping these companies evolve. If you look, for example, at what BHP Billiton has done in Chile to, to help some, at, at this point, 50, and their ambitions are to have over 200 local suppliers actually become globally competitive in, in, in supplying services, that's an example of, of a, a program that's lasted over a number of years and really has had success and has allowed BHP to lower its costs as a result of the, the work. On, on small companies, it may say, sound a little bit funny, but um, we see that small companies that are looking for a role for themselves um, can play a little bit um, similar role to what Graham says that Mercy Corps does, in the sense that there's an opportunity for a, a small company to be a catalyst. Oftentimes, large companies will say, well, we're big enough, we have enough resources to go on our own, but small companies can be catalysts and, and, and also say, okay, well, who else cares about this problem? Who else is going to be here? And who can we bring together in a different way? It's enormously disappointing that even in the same regions, you see over and over again mining companies refusing to work together, oil and gas companies refusing to work together because they want to, to capture the credit for what they've done instead of really trying to resolve the problem. And then one quick comment on, on security. Um, I think it's, it's important, it's a very complicated problem. You can't avoid the, the, the nature in many of these places to do um, a, a, a control of the security problems. But more companies need to think more about prevention of this as well. And certainly the example um, that Chevron has in the Niger Delta, where they're thinking about tackling the root problems that are driving security issues, it, it holds a lot of promise. But to do that is something that's very hard to do. You have to build institutional capital. You have to think about how you can tackle the problems that are driving the security problems, such as poverty, such as cultural mistrust among different ethnic groups or different tribes, such as um, the lack of opportunity that's out there. Um, but you see in a number of places there are some companies that are starting to think more about prevention in terms of tackling the root problems that are causing the security issues instead of just working to, to control them. Okay, I want to hear from Harry Pastuzic, Tom Outlaw, and this woman. So these three. Harry's back there, Mike behind you. Mike behind you. Sorry. Then Tom Outlaw, and then this woman here. Those three. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Dan. Um, I really just wanted to make a comment relevant to a few of the You're aspects. XIFC Pixera right? So sure, I'm sorry, that's right, rank um, and all, all that information. I work at Pixera Global, uh, an NGO here in DC, formerly of IFC and then of Bechtel. Um, so I've got some interesting insights. The, the point about capacity building for NGOs who try to work in, in local content, I think was a good one. Um, coming out of an experience working with an engineering procurement and construction contractor that does work for oil and gas companies, um, I think I have, a, you know, I, I learned a lot about how one um, can incentivize uh, local content. Um, so that, that is a really uh, a valid point. On the issue of smaller players, um, it's been touched on to an extent. Um, they present opportunities as well as risks. I think. Um, we, we're fortunate enough to be aligned with Anadarko in Mozambique, and we're doing um, very good work building on the experiences we had in the early days in Baku, um, in Sakhalin, and then in, in the Kai project in Angola, right? 
Um, and so you get opportunities with a Cosmos Energy or with a Hess or with an Anadarko in some cases that you don't with big players, I think, um, to when they are open to what they don't know. Uh, so that's, that's one point. And then just something that hasn't come up and if the panelists would talk about on the issue of shared value, how do you see the rise of national oil companies, mm -hmm. particularly in a sub-Saharan African context, playing out? Tom Outlaw, formerly of USAID and also with a, formerly of a mining company, now back at AID. Uh, yeah, so Tom Outlaw, uh, formerly of AID, um, about to go back, uh, but I just finished a four-year stint in Madagascar. Uh, managing external relations for <clears throat> the world's largest uh, nickel mine, uh, the Embodivi project that's managed by Shared International in Canada. Um, first off, uh, hats off to CSIS and Dan for using uh, your substantial convening power to have a forum like this. Um, I think it's a great use of your time and resources. I'd like maybe one more chair to be there for one of the bilaterals. I think that would add to the robustness of the conversation. Um, quick question for Veronica and then uh, maybe a question slash observation uh, for Matt. Uh, it, Veronica, I wanted your perspective on the proliferation in the standard setting business. Um, I, I've only been back here four months, but I've already seen three separate presentations on uh, organizations that are coming up with a new standards Bible, trying to sort of outrigger the next, the last guy. Um, at the end of the day, our company uh, paid attention to the IFC standards, not, no offense, because they were the best. Uh, but because they were written into about $500 million of our lending covenants. And to Dan's earlier point, that's what got the CFO in the room. And so at the end of the day, that sort of interest alignment uh, is what drove our attention. So I wonder if you consider this uh, sort of a, a form of the imitation game a good thing? Is it a thousand flowers blooming is great, it means the sector's growing, people are paying more attention? Uh, or on the corporate side, you see it as muddying the water. I mean. Too many standards confuses corporate executives when they want to have to have a long-term decision about which one they're going to pick and follow. At the end of the day, my preference would be to have less than more and would be to focus on the implementation and the technical assistance around how to achieve that. Um, question for Matt. I, I want somebody to explain the, the I consider a disconnect. Um, often, it's been my experience that the social and environmental activities are almost always nested within the health and safety departments. I don't have a complete understanding of why that is, but I do know that it is the case. Um, however, the acceptance of the linkage between spending on health and safety and the outcomes, LTIs and deaths, is almost axiomatic, right? There's never a question that, well, of course, our spending on health and safety is what leads to the reductions in death and injury. But that's often not the case with uh, social environmental spending. So when I go to my CEO and I say, look, we had two blockages, pitchforks and torches at the plant site last year, and we had a week-long blockage at our mine site, which led to a full shutdown of the facility. This year, after thousands of hours of investment of time, resources, meeting people to death, we had nothing. That doesn't automatically translate into a budget increase. And to me, that would be the indicator that shared value, re interest alignment, win-win, whatever you want to call it, is actually truly mainstreamed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, my friend, is, my friend in the third row. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mr. Tanya, for this wonderful event. We hope all players in Africa on minerals and the oil cars were in this event, and we need to pick a uh, conference for this event here on shared value. Uh, I'm a non-profit organization uh, which focuses on conflicts and violence, and uh, also a business person that fo focuses on oil and gas and minerals. How do you work with the small, just as Matt said, working with the small players on the ground instead of them being brokers, and then you end up into problems, and then it becomes uh, conflicts. Like a woman like me, you say it's small players or businesses are only for cooking. No, I'm a woman-owned business. I come from Africa, I'm really in oil and gas, and I'm in mining. How do we work with you to make this happen? And other people on the ground, small businesses, this is what brings conflicts. But if it's a shared value, the local people are benefiting. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., we are working together. Then you are not seeing those conflicts, because I know the problems of those countries, the, what they face. And uh, with that, I think the collaboration and uh, information 
sharing and such events, Mr. Daniel, let it be global and in Africa so that people can understand what shared value is in their minerals and in their oil and gas. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm seeing some of my colleagues begin to hover. So we've got, for so the panel, I've got about five more minutes uh, because we have to uh, take down the, the room. So I'm gonna ask folks to be economical in your responses. So why don't we go down the road this way again. Veronica, start with you and everyone, and we'll end with Dane. Okay, great. Uh, Tom, thanks for that great question. I think I agree with the proliferation of standards. It's interesting in our experience, our standards bring a lot of people to us because they think that getting the stamp of approval of following through on our standards helps them both as an entree into host governments, they're viewed as the you know, developer of choice, but also it helps them raise other capital in the open market because it is, has demonstrated to really help manage these non-technical risks that we're talking about. Um, however, for some people, it seems like a lot of work and they feel like they could sign up with an equator bank or somebody else and still say that they're meeting certain standards without necessarily the intense scrutiny that uh, you know, they go through with IFC. But I think the way that we're responding to that is trying to work more and more. Like you know, Matt said, there's not a lot of discussion at the industry level. And I think maybe there is more in mining than there is in oil and gas, but I could be wrong. I mean, we're spending a lot of time working with ICMM, working with the folks at PDAC, talking to the Canadian Mining Association, working with the mining and metals at the World Economic Forum to really talk about, for example, water. When we're talking about water, are we using the same language? Are we asking our companies and partners to meet the same objectives? How can we harmonize even just the language that we're using before it gets to a particular standard? And we're, we're agreeing, this is not anybody's TOR, but we're agreeing that it's very confusing for our partners and clients. When we, even when we put the same point in different language, you know, they don't have time to reconcile all of this. So I think um, increasingly that's where a lot of us are gonna be investing our energy. And I, I think th there's, there's a lot of good coming from it, but um, you know, we're not there yet. So I just wanted to mention, if I can, Dan, on the local content discussion, what didn't come out was the access to finance which is absolutely critical. We have a very complex program in Guinea which includes legislative support for things like leasing laws and local content legislation, also local procurement for the um, off-taking companies, their strategies, as well as SME capacity building. But access to finance is really something that the companies cannot be expected to provide and where we need more private sector to jump in. Thanks. Okay, Graham. <coughs> Graham gets the MVP award for being on the panel. Thanks for being. Oh my gosh! Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks everybody for bearing with me. Um, I'll just echo a little bit that the last point about the importance of uh, of small businesses and small organizations in the communities where the extractive companies are operating. Um, that's definitely been Mercy Corps' approach. We don't start out in a community looking for a partnership with a multinational company. We start out in communities working with with them and looking at their resources and then their opportunities starting with local businesses, and then trying to work with those local businesses and see where's the pathway to prosperity for this community. And often it involves taking that relationship a step up and bringing in the multinational company that's also present uh, in the community. But it's definitely building strength in the community from the bottom up um, and not trying to come in with the, with the multinational company as the focus. Jane? Um, uh, very quickly, the, the, the question on the, the, the link between you know, the health safety departments and safety having a higher priority, I think, I think there's a question of you know, needing to do more work on the metrics, the social metrics and getting the clear metrics, but I think the metrics follow prioritization and strategy, and to me, where you see the difference is where you've got a CEO and a senior management team who are saying that the social environmental side has to be part of budget planning, project planning, and you know, the strategic pillars of the, of the company, and then I think you know, we'll be more effective at aligning, aligning and prioritizing metrics. Also, very much second um, Graham's point on the, the importance of small businesses, sort of local businesses, as well as local NGOs, and you're know, finding ways to identify and work collectively with, with local players and woman-owned businesses being a key element. And then a, I guess a challenge to Dan to finish off with, I think having some shared value conversations at the country level or regional level would be important because the more and more we can do this at the, at the country operational level, the better. Fair enough. So I detected in your question an, an air of frustration over sort of how, how organized, there you go, the thumbs up on that. Um, uh, I, my, IQ, my EQ is high today. Um, uh, of, 
of how, how uh, CSR functions are uh, situated within organizations. And, and so I, I'm a fairly impatient person, but just to put in a little bit of context, you know, we've been around for 135 years. The discipline of, of, of CSR has been around for all of 25 years and shared value for all of four or five years, right? So um, it, it's, it's difficult to pivot all that quickly, but having said all that, in the last 10 years, the function of CSR, at least at Chevron, is embedded within our business units. They sit on the leadership teams. Um, our new country managers go through workshops uh, uh, are around the, 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 the expectations around CSR to build their capacity, and they have expectations building into, the, into their business plan. So I think there's a lot of progress being made. I don't think that the function, irrespective of where it may reside in the organizational chart, I don't think the function is, is, is now bootstrapped to, to the organization. Um, but I think uh, a fully functioning partner within the business. But to Jane's point, the metrics are important. For, in a company of engineers and scientists, data matters. And as long as we continue to take an evidence-based approach to the work we do, we continue to build and grow the, 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 the credibility of the function. Dan, you have the last word. What's interesting is I actually haven't found as much that, that companies are not willing to, to devote enough resources because many, um, if the asset that they're um, trying to protect, protect is, is something that they've invested hundreds, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of, and if there's a real risk of disruption, then they are willing to spend a lot of money. I, I had one CEO tell me, uh, you know, I can spend hundreds of millions of dollars on, on social projects and I'm glad to do it. Um, the, the issue is what they spend the money on, um, because what happens is most companies, unfortunately, are still taking too much of a checklist approach. You know, if we do this, we do this, we do this, then, then hopefully we will prevent disruptions to our operations, when really they have to take an approach that takes into consideration the root causes of what may cause those risks. So if you really um, were able to have a set of policies and, and programs that, that took you from a dynamic where there was active disruption in one year to no disruption in the next, that means you didn't take a checklist approach. That means you really listed, listened to the communities. Um, that means you really understood what the problems were. I think when in this kind of resource constrained environment though, what you're gonna find is that companies, when they look at shared value, they see opportunities that they can't avoid. And so when budgets are being cut um, and they need to be cut because they're simply, the, the price has dropped by 50% um, for their, their key asset, um, they will continue, they, they will stop investing in building the local clinic, but, in, but they will do things like we've seen Anglo Gold Ashanti do in Ghana where they've taken a systematic approach to tackle the problem of malaria because it, in addition to decreasing malaria by 72%, they also decreased their lost work hours by 98% as a result of malaria. Now that delivers real results to the company and profound social impact. The more companies are able to find those things instead of taking a checklist approach, the more you're gonna see them continue to invest. Thank you very Dan, much. Dan, could I I'm add one? Add, no, one? I'm, I'm okay. gonna, we do have to end it, I'm sorry. sorry. Listen, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I, I need, listen, I'm sorry, I just, I need to ask you guys for your cooperation from the panelists. I'm gonna ask the panelists, I'm gonna ask folks not to accost the panelists at the end of this and let them walk out because we have to uh, take this down in 20 minutes for a 500 person event. So I would ask you to just honor my request and let the panelists walk out and then talk to the panelists outside there. Please join me in thanking the panel.